So our next presenter is Jeffrey Desmet from Red Hat. And uh, Jeffrey is an author of uh, a very popular uh, optimization solver uh, known as Constraint Solver and or Opta Planner. And uh, Jeffrey is an, certainly an expert in this area and supports this product for many years. But uh, uh, being in uh, constraint programming uh, myself, I am actually a specification lead for one of the standards, I would say that Jeffrey in a way maverick in uh, this movement. And uh, he's not usually joining big conferences and it has uh, big advantages. First of all, his solver is built on based on local search, contrary to a lot of other popular constraint solvers. And but it gives him a lot of advantages from performance uh, point of view. And second uh, differentiator is that the Jeffrey works for one of the major vendor of business software. It means he has access to real world applications and he always brings real world perspective to optimization world, what is not the most popular. And uh, as you will see from uh, his today's presentation and from previous achievements with uh, Jeffrey had, uh, he's always very practical and he can explain quite popular, quite complex uh, concept in a very simple and understandable way. And uh, I hope we will see you today. Jeffrey, take the floor. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Jacob. Thank you. Um, yes, a little bit of a maverick. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about is about the modern uh, object-oriented functional programming constraint solver. And so uh, it's a bit different from the, what I call the traditional constraint solvers, uh, actually quite different. And I'll be trying to point that out. I'll try to point out the benefits uh, from this uh, very different approach versus traditional solvers, right? So um, now before we get started, I would like to maybe just first explain what is a constraint solver, right? Um, they also call this mathematical optimization software. You might wonder how does this fit into the rest of um, you know, decision modeling and so forth. Now, um, let me first explain what a typical uh, uh, solver does. Here's a one use case. It's a school timetabling use case. You probably remember this from when you were at school. Um, there's a number of lessons that need to be taught. So for example, math, chemistry, French, and history. And there's a number of rooms and a number of periods to teach them in. So for example, you could say, I'm going to teach math in room A at 8.30, but you could also do it in room B, or you could do it in room B at 9.30 and so forth, right? Now there's a number of constraints. This is the reason why they call this a constraint solver, right? Um, and for example, one of them might be that math and chemistry have the same students. You can see here both are the ninth grade, so they have the same students. So those two lessons cannot be taught at the same time, yeah, right? Um, for example, chemistry and French, they have the same teacher. Both are being uh, taught by Marie Curie, so they need to be at, uh, at a different time too. Right. So what happens is you give this to a constraint solver, mathematical optimization software, any of them, and what you will do is you, it will output you a solution. So for example, in this case, it will tell you, okay, let's do math at uh, room A, A30, let's do French at room B at A30, and this will all work. You can see that the ninth grade can do all of its lessons, the 10th grade can do all of its lessons, and Marie can actually teach both lessons. They're in a different room, but um, she, can, uh, she, do, she doesn't need to be at two places at the same time. Now you might think, okay, um, can we not solve this with a decision table, or, you know? Um, why not simply say, okay, we pick one lesson, right? We run it to a decision table, and then based upon the decision table, we decide where to put it. Um, the problem is the first lesson, right? Because the first lesson can basically fit anywhere, right? But the trouble is, wherever you put it, you have, um, well, if you have four lessons, you have a one out of four chance of putting it on the right, on the right location, right? If you have 400 lessons, you have one out of 400 chances to put it on the right location. If you then look at the second lesson, you have one out of 399 chances to put it on the right location, right? Um, okay, maybe a few less because there, there are potential conflicts with match, you can actually figure it out with the decision table. But the story is decision tables don't work for this. You can't just put one lesson at a time. You need to put all of them together and they influence each other. And they call this kind of problems NP-hard or NP-complete problems. But simply put, there are problems where you need an optimizer, where a simple decision table or sim simple decision framework doesn't work anymore. Right? So 
Um, here's another use case, and this is the one I'll be focusing on most of this uh, presentation. Um, it's employee rostering. In this case, we need to assign shifts to employees. So we get a number of employees as input. Uh, to, you see here two nurses, an engineer, and a designer. And then we have a number of shifts, like a morning shift, an afternoon shift, or uh, an evening shift. Sometimes multiple morning shifts on the same day. You can see here on Monday, we have two morning shifts. And what um, our constraint solver needs to decide is which shift go, is assigned to which person. You can see the assignments already happened here. So you can see, for example, that um, on Monday, we already assigned um, this morning shift to the first nurse and this afternoon shift to the second nurse. And of course, there's constraints that, that play into this. Um, these are not that important for this presentation, although we will go to implement in one of them. Um, uh, but these are, for example, the hard constraints, right? So for example, an, an, any employee can only have one shift per day, right? And we'll see later how we implement that uh, with, for example, a traditional solver and with a modern solver and uh, why I believe a modern solver is a potentially better approach. Um, there's other constraints here, like require, uh, skill requirements, or uh, certain uh, employees cannot work in the weekend because of that contract. And these are typically hard constraints. And on top of that, you also have soft constraints. Right? Soft constraint is, for example, there's a day off re request. This particular nurse doesn't want to work on Friday. She wants to go out or whatever, right? Um, and um, that uh, is a day off request. Now, you want to give as many day off requests. You want to honor as many of these as possible, but you won't be able to honor all of them. For example, on Christmas, everybody wants a day off. And uh, of course, you will have to assign uh, people in, in the hospital to actually work, right? So um, that's a soft constraint. You want to minimize the amount of penalty you get there. And, and a penalty is anything, anytime you actually do something that breaks any of these constraints, potentially weighted by how, how bad you break it, right? So that's the difference between soft uh, and hard skill, uh, hard constraints. Hard constraints need, cannot be broken. Soft constraints can be broken. They are over lesser priority. And sometimes you might actually have multiple levels, just hard and soft constraints. Uh, which is also an interesting case uh, when uh, especially traditional versus uh, modern solvers. But I'll get into that later. Now, uh, before I actually uh, jump into the main part of this presentation, I just want to just want to iterate um, that um, that uh, sorry, constraint solvers can deal with many uh, use cases, right? It's not just that employee rostering problem or that um, or that uh, school timetabling problem. Uh, one of the big ones is, for example, the vehicle routing problem, where you need to send out uh, potentially thousands or ten thousands of vehicles on the roads, and they need to go to potentially hundred thousands of locations. And you want to optimize that, and you want to reduce your driving time. And typically, constraint solvers reduce the driving time by like tw twenty-five percent uh, versus. Uh, more, you know, the default uh, things that people usually do for these use cases, including manual planning, human planning, right? Um, there's many others, uh, bin packing, assigning processes to the cloud, a playlist that I've just shown you, equipment scheduling, deciding which CAT scanner uh, goes to which patient, which hospital bed goes to which patient, patient or which uh, or rental or, or giving out rental cars, that kind of things. And job shop scheduling, uh, which is typically when you're dealing with assembly lines and you might be you know, building furniture or cars or things like that. And there's many, many more use cases. Um, um, every day we, we see new ones, right? So um, let's get into the, the, the main topic of this, this, this uh, uh, presentation. I'll, I'll go a bit deeper now. Um, if you're not that familiar with constraint solving, it, it might be a bit hard, but I'll try to explain it as, as simple as possible. Um, and, and I want to compare the traditional solvers versus modern solvers, specifically on the cases I've just shown earlier. Uh, the traditional solvers typically call these kinds of cases MIP cases, mixed integer pro uh, pro uh, programming cases. Uh, I'll, I'll just call them constraint solving cases for now. Um, so let's take a look. How do you define your domain? How do you define your input and your output? Right? And how does it differ between a traditional solver and a, a modern solver? Right? So a traditional solver says you can only have um, uh, variables, so things that change during, during solving. Right. Uh, I, I tend to call them planning variables. Um, others might call them um, optimization variables. Right. Um, they can only be of type Boolean, Integer, or Double, right? Uh, for those of you not programming Java, of course, with Double, I mean a 64-bit floating, uh, floating point number, right? Um, and then in, um, in a modern approach, uh, uh, in a modern solver, you can say, my variable type, you can define your own variable type. You can say, I have a time slot, like in school time tailing, so I'm going to assign lessons to Skype time slot. 
uh, I'm not going to assign them to integers or to doubles, right? Um, I have a lesson I'm going to assign them to rooms, right? They might have two planning variables, right? Two variables, right? One for time slot, one for room. Uh, for shift rostering, you're going to assign shifts to please, so the, the variable would be complete, and so forth. For facility location problem, problem I didn't discuss yet, uh, we're going to assign consumers to facilities. Um, yes, you can still use Boolean integers and doubles and big decimals even, which is the decimal uh, form uh, instead of a floating point number. Uh, in, in the Java world, at least, um, but um, you'll usually won't need them. Not for you know MIP cases, I would argue, right? Um, and 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 so um, I'd argue that the left side, the traditional approach, is what I call linear programming friendly. Why is this? The implementation is typically linear programming, and as Jacob already explained, uh, the modern, at least in, in my implementation, is a local search. Uh, it's local search variants there. A whole bunch of different uh, algorithms we, we we can use there or we can combine there but in general the idea is local search or at least meta heuristics there, there's even non-local search implementations there and um, that allows us uh, to do it to work on this and to be actually modern programming friendly and I'll show that later so uh, how can uh, we be Jeffrey uh, well I'm sorry to interrupt you while you're on this slide so basically you specify domain specific language for constraint programming uh, introducing domain specific terms like uh, room employee facility yeah yes yeah and so instead of saying we're assigned a lesson to let's say uh, an int where the int needs to be one to ten because we have ten rooms right we assign a lesson to room right um, and, and I would argue that's more object oriented friendly. And the nice thing is you can even do polymorphism. So you could have your lesson be extended by, uh, you know, uh, a, a, an A lesson and a B lesson. Uh, I have a bit of trouble getting a good examples here. Um, you might have, uh, you know, like a driving lesson might actually have specific extra variables uh, because they need to assign a car than a normal lesson, right? So you might actually extend your lesson by driving. But lesson. all your concepts are predefined. Uh, or you use and you use some universal uh, language uh, like Java to represent uh, these domain-specific concepts. Or? No, uh, they actually implement them. Uh, so I, I ja, uh, so the uh, in our solver there is no time slot, there is no room, there is no employee. That's actually the implementations or quick start to this, of course. But any uh, the users that use it, they define their thing. They define a time slot, a room, employee. Um, sometimes they name them horribly and then I don't know what they actually are, but, but um, yeah. They, they, but constraint programming people always did this. They always, they never, they hide the uh, Boolean or constraint integer variables inside the classes using yeah. uh, Java or C++. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, so um, in the class, in the classes, right? So if you look at the implementation of, of a model declaration in traditional one, um, this is, for example, one of the big ones of the tier one constraint solvers. Um, um, what they do is you have a model and then you have variables, but both model and variable here come from the constraint solver. It's defined by the constraint solver. It's an import from them, right? And what you then do, for example, here is you go through all of the shifts, all of the employees, and you say, okay, I have an assignment uh, of, um, here's a, a Boolean two-dimensional array of saying, okay, this particular shift, to that particular employee, I'm going to add a binary variable, basically a Boolean variable, right? One or zero uh, to, the, to this, uh, this combination. Now you could, you could argue uh, there, there's definitely certain techniques. This is actually come directly. This is, um, you, there's certain techniques where you put this in a class, but the variable itself, even though the compassing class might be a lesson, the variable itself will still be a Boolean or an integer or uh, a double, I would argue. Um, um, Unless I'm mistaken, of course, right? But that's at least what, what I always see. Um, and then when you look at the modern approach, in the modern approach, we say, okay, we have we will define a class shift, right? And we'll define a variable and leader. And you can see it's not just the, the, that the variable is inside a class, it's also that the variable itself is not of type uh, Boolean int or double. It's actually of type employee because we were assigning shifts to employee, we're not assigning shifts to numbers, right? And the benefit of that we'll see later in the constraints is that um, when we add, want to add a constraint and say, okay, if does this employee want to work in the weekend, we can actually, you, you know, in our constraints, we'll be able to use that. Of course, we do need to give the input to the, to the modern solver. So then basically, for example, we have a, what we call a, like here a timetable, a list of all the employees, a list of all the, sh the shifts, and we give that to the solver to solve. And then it returns us this and the shifts are then assigned to employees. They actually start out as MLL. Now, um, 
I hope this answers your questions, Jacob. And, and I also would like to say, when you look at this code, right, and you would need to draw a class diagram to really understand how does the, my, my, my domain model look like, uh, which of these would be easier? Well, I tried it. And so here's what I get. On the traditional solver, what I get is I get a Boolean, a, a two-dimensional Boolean array, right? Well, on the modern solver, I would argue you get um, a shift assigned to an employee. And, and so I get a pretty good idea on the right side of what this is doing. But even more, if you look at the instances of this, how does this work? Well, let's say we have four shifts, right? Four morning shifts. Uh, so two morning shifts on Monday, an, an evening shift on Monday, and a morning shift on Tuesday. And then we need to assign these to and that or call. We have three employees, right? Well, in the two-dimensional Boolean array, what they, do, what they do is in a traditional solver typically, is they create um, for every combination of a shift and every combination of an employee, they create a Boolean variable being zero or one, right? Even though they have two, two shifts, um, most of the time these shifts on the same day are not 100% the same. They might have a different uh, skill requirement, they might be on a different location, they might have a different affinity, um, and even if they are 100% correct, uh, the same, uh, even in that case they would typically still split out. There are cases where they wouldn't. Right? Um, on a modern solver, however, what we do is we say, okay, we're going to for the employee, we're going to uh, for the shift, we're going to assign it to one employee, starting out as null as, as no employee, of course. But after it's solved, we're going to assign it to either Anne, Carl, or Beth. So the model inherently does not allow for multiple employees to be assigned to the same shift instance, right? We cannot assign to this first one uh, both Anne and Carl at the same time. The model simply doesn't permit it, right? You can change your model if you do want to allow these kind of things, right? So on the left side. You have a problem because you could the solver could end up saying, okay, I, I put in one for n and I put a one for bet, right? Um, or I put none at all, all zeros, right? So you need to prevent that. And, and to prevent that, you need to add a housekeeping hard constraint. You need to say um, this is the all diff constraint, right? But what you basically say is um, no, this is not the all diff constraint, sorry. But what you basically say is you, you sum up these numbers, these booleans, and you say, okay, they need to be equal to one, right? So one of these values need to be one and all of the others need to be zero. And you need to do this for each of the constraints. So you get basically uh, four extra uh, hard constraints, I would argue, right? Or at least instances of that. Now, if you then look at the memory usage behind this, well, if you have four shifts and three employees in the traditional model, we have 12 fields. Now you might argue this is booleans, but uh, in a 64-bit computer, a boolean takes in more than one bit. It actually takes at least a byte, right? Uh, even in a boolean array, at least in most implementation languages, not, a, not always, right? Um, so if you have 20,000 shifts with 1,000 employees, you get actually 20 million uh, booleans you have to deal with. And, and that can actually cause memory issues. In fact, we'll see that in one of the benchmark that can cause out of memory issues, right? Now, if you inf instead do uh, use an, in a modern approach, well, there we, if you assign four shifts to three employees, we get four uh, references. They're not, they're not booleans anymore. They're actually references you know, or pointers uh, right, in, in C++ terms. Um, so they do take up 64 bits, right? But, but that, that, that's, in general, it scales much better. Why? It actually scales in the number of shifts, not in the number of shifts times employees. So that's, a, that's, that's one of the, the first differences I would like to point out between a traditional and modern solver, right? Um, now, if you then look at the output, well, in both cases, what we're going to do is we're going to solve it, right? In the traditional one, we say, okay, model solve. In the modern one, uh, at least in our implementation, we say, okay, solver solve this problem. So we give it the timetable and it gives us back the solve timetable, right? Um, now, on the left side, when we solve this, we still need to get our data out of it, right? We still need to know which shifts were assigned to which employee. So we need to go through all of the shifts. We'll need the actual shift itself. So we can just go over the indexes of the shifts, but we'll need the actual shift itself uh, to at least know which shift we're talking about, right? Uh, if it, is it the morning morning shift? Um, and then the employee, same thing. We can just go through the indexes, but we need to know which employee it is. So we need to, need, need to figure out the name of the employee at the very least. So we need to fetch the name too. And then here's the interesting part. Then we say, if the assignments of that shift to that employee, uh, we get that value, and that value is uh, almost one or one, then uh, we consider this an assignment. Then, for example, you know, the morning shift is assigned to N. Right? Well, in the other approach, what we simply do is we say, okay, we go over all the shifts, 
and we just say, okay, is the employee, what is the employee assigned to that shift? And then and that's that value. Now this, this almost one is interesting, I would argue. Um, why is that not, or, you know, why is that not simply equal to one? Or why is it not just, why doesn't it return a Boolean? It, it should be returning a Boolean, right? It, it's a Boolean variable. Well, they call this a leaky abstraction. So um, what, what basically happens is that uh, beneath this is, they are typically using uh, linear programming and um, they might not respond with, uh, and, and they, the Boolean is actually translated into a number, a continuous number. And through all kinds of uh, methods, they make sure that it ends up one or close to one or zero or close to zero. And so you basically get a little bit of like a threshold or a confidence, uh, confidence uh, threshold, you might even argue. But basically you need to check, uh, you need to, you need to check if it's in, in bigger than 99. And, 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 and and, and I have to say, most of the cases, it, you know, it's, it's always clearly either very close to one or very close to zero. Um, but we do have to do this, right? And um, one of the reasons for this is also numerical instability. So I'd like to jump into numerical instability because uh, that's one that really plagues a lot of the traditional solvers and which modern solvers, 99% mm, of the case, 90% uh, of the code don't worry about at all because they don't have to, they, they don't deal with the same issues, right? So what is num numerical instability? Uh, most of you probably know this from computer science classes, but I'll go through it again because it was just fun, right? So um, when you do say a double, so a 64-bit floating point number, you'll, you'll find this in any language. Uh, this is just Java code, but this will work in any language. And you do 0 0.01 plus 0 0.09, right? Both floating points. When you print that out, you do not get 0 0.10. You should get the 0 0.10, but you don't. You get 0 0.09999999, right? And so uh, this is numerical instability. When you do floating point arithmetic, um, then rounding errors occur, right? And so um, I can go through the whole uh, theory behind this, but the only thing you really need to know, this is the Wikipedia entry, but basically uh, a floating point is an integer multiplied by a power of two. Ever anything else here is, is just a little bit too deep right now. And I just wanna, just wanna visualize how, how numerical instability happens. So presume we have these Java literals, these, this, these numbers we write in our source code, right? And this works again for other languages too. What will really happen is it will translate this into a floating point number. It can represent, as remember, an integer multiplied by a power of two, right? Turns out these two numbers, zero and 0 0.125, can be exactly represented as uh, such a thing. But these three numbers, 0 0.01, 0 0.09, and 0 0.10, cannot. And so what they will just do is they will just pick, uh, there's two numbers that, are, that can be rep represented like this, which are closest to this, right? And they'll just pick the one that's closest. So if you write down in your source code 0 0.01, the, the actual number you get, well, to calculate with is this large uh, thing over here, right? And then uh, for 0 0.09, you get this blue thing, and for the, the 0 0.10, you get this green thing, right? Notice there, so notice there's there's some deviance from it. It's very very small. If you look at it, it's five to you know ten to the power of maybe minus twenty or something. It's it's not much, right? It's barely noticeable. However, if you sum up the purple plus the blue thing, and that's of course what the CPU does for you, you get the what I call the orange thing here. And it turns out the closest literal that is the same amount, you know, up to what is it, the number of decimals we need here uh, from the spec. Uh, to, to be have a difference from that one. It turns out the closest number to that, closest Java literal to that, or in any, in, in, like in the other languages, is ex except is in fact this orange one. And so you get uh, a rounding error or of 0 0.0000000 and so forth, one, right? And you might think, ha, what's that? A rounding error of such a small number, who cares, uh, right? It's not important, right? It's not like it kills people. The only problem is it, it actually does kill people. Um, so um, in, in, in 1991, they uh, fired this Patriot uh, missile um, in, in the Iraqi war. And what happened is um, there was a bug in there, right? A uh, small chopping error multiplied by a large number uh, every, every tenth of a second. It led to a significant error. And so what actually happened is they, they missed by a distance of 600 meters. So instead of shooting at the enemy, they, shoot, they shot at their own forces. They, they actually caused friendly fire and, and killed their own forces, right? 
Um, and this is not the only occurrence where um, you know, floating point arithmetic has caused severe uh, issues, right? Um, for example, the best way to get fired in a, in a bank is to use floating point arithmetic. Why? Because they know that if there is a rounding error and you find a way to exploit that in a loop, you can just you know, check out millions from the bank, right? Um, uh, so um, numeric, like, numerical instability matters, I would matter. Now, why am I talking about numerical instability so much? It's because a traditional solver, um, most of them, not all of them, there's a few notable exceptions even, uh, but most of them, they, internally, they use a lot of uh, floating point arithmetic. They actually represent the solution or the problem or the constraints as a, as a big uh, floating point matrix and then do all kinds of, you know, it's linear equations. And then they, they, they do a lot of transformations on that. And every single transformation uh, can cause uh, you know, a rounding error. And so they live and die by the ability to manage their, num their, their numerical instability. And um, I must say they're, they're, they're genius at that, right? The, the, the best solvers, the best traditional solvers in the world, they, they, they are really, really good at, at limiting that numerical instability. But it still flows through, like we've seen in, in the API earlier, and there's actually more cases like that. The famous uh, threshold, anything below, what is it, 0 0.000001, gets thrown out, gets, gets, gets not seen, you know, gets rounded uh, to, to, the, to the nearest number. Um, and you can play with that, that threshold, by the way. Um, and then the output is floating points again. Yes, Jacob. Uh, I need to defend constraint solvers a little bit, traditional Go solvers, because nobody really writes uh, more or equal zero. 0.99 because uh, all implementation for from a user perspective they equal they compare boolean so they compare the sign equal but implementation of operator in, uh, input actually takes care about uh, numerical instability so it's hidden inside the implementation not uh, not on a user would never write like uh, you suggested I found that in one of the examples of one of the big solvers, but I was probably looking at a different one. So no, no, if you look on major solvers from like uh, ILOG, uh, uh, CP, or, or any other solvers, they never write this. And uh, in JSR331, we certainly have uh, people writing the user-friendly format, represent problems, but implementation uh, takes care about uh, these problems. The only thing what I should give you, it's uh, about memory representation. If you found the way to do it in much better way, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fair point. You, you, I always wondered, in that particular solver that, again, this is a tier one solver, um, why they didn't just return a boolean? I'll, you know, <laughs> um, just, to, just take that bit for users, right? But anyway, and maybe they do. Maybe I didn't look through the API well enough. I'm, I'm not an expert in the traditional solvers, uh, but I do, ha I do have implemented a bunch of cases in there. Um, so um, on the modern side, um, the input is object oriented. Um, again, the variables are not uh, floating point numbers or, in, uh, you know, they're actual class references, right? So, um, and internally, uh, especially if it's using local search and stuff like that, there is no floating point arithmetic, except maybe for some things like a random selection, like local search can do heuristics and heuristics can use random selection and flow, and then you can have rounding errors, but that's all fine because they don't, they don't uh, compound, they, they just, you know, uh, we need to worry about numerical stability there too, but uh, they, they don't escape uh, and they don't loop up, right? Um, so virtually no numerical instability, at least 99%, right? It's, it's not, it might not be, no, 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 nothing is ever 100%, right? So uh, let's take a look at the constraints. So what happens if you want to implement a constraint? So uh, in a traditional uh, solver, you need to add a mathematical equation, right? Um, so, um, and I'll, and, 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 okay, we can do limited callbacks and stuff like that. I, I won't go too deep on that. And you also have what they call linear limitations or sometimes linear or quadratic limitations. So of course the tier one solvers both support linear and quadratic limitations. I'll talk a bit in a minute what I mean by that. And, and I'll show you some code that will make a, a lot more clear for people who, who are not that familiar with constraint solving at this time. Uh, but if you then look at the modern approach, uh, this is a functional programming approach, which basically means you can say, I have a piece of code here and I just want to reuse that. And that piece of code can be things like uh, things from Java.time from, uh, you know, 
um, from time libraries or, or date libraries. Now, if you've ever tried to write uh, you know, a mathematical equation that can deal with the fact that there's something like daylight saving time, um, my head goes off to you because it's, it is really, really difficult. Daylight saving time is a very complex uh, problem. It's really something where you want to reuse existing code, right? And um, so it's really nice when you can do that. And of course, um, they don't suffer from linear quadratic limitations. Um, now, um, I would argue, and this is a pure opinion, and, you, <laughs> and I'm sure many people will disagree with this, I would argue that the traditional solver is an API spec written for the tool to make it easy to implement for a tool. Um, for those who have, or, or, have been along or, or around a long time in the Java world, like EGP2, you know, uh, worked really well for the tool implementers, really bad for the, well, that was for, far more horrible than traditional solvers, I would argue. Um, well, the modern approach, the API spec is written for the users, right? And um, and again, in the Java world, for, that was hibernated and they, they completely uh, eliminated EGB2 because they simply had, you know, they were written for the users, not for the tool, right? So, um, let me show you the code. It's probably going to be clearer to, to just show you in, in the detail, the difference here. So in a traditional solver, let's say we want to do one shift per day. Remember for the employees, we can only assign one shift per employee per day, right? So in a traditional solver, what you would do is, okay, we need to do this for every employee. So we're going to loop through the employees, right? So for every employee, we're going to check, does this person have uh, multiple shifts on the same day? So we need to go through all of the, the days. Now, I presume we pre-calculated the day somehow by just going over the shifts and grouping them per day, right? So we know all of the days. So let's go over all of the days. And then we're going to build an expression for, so for a particular day, for a particular employee, we're going to figure out how many shifts are assigned there. And if it's more than one, eh -eh, that's bad. So we're going to go through all of the shifts. If that shift is assigned on that day, right? If that's a shift of, of that day, it's not assigned on a day. If it's a shift of that day, we cannot we cannot change the day that the shift happens. That that's that's input, right? Um, so when we see that a particular shift is uh, on a certain day, then we're going to check if that employee is assigned to that sh shift. And if it is, we're going to add a term. I'll show you how this how this mathematical equation ends up looking like. And um, if and so if multiple of these terms are added and multiple of these variables are ended up true, uh, then the sum of that will be more than one. So every time uh, there's an assignment to that sh to that particular shift uh, for that employee, uh, then we you know we do plus one. And then we're going to say, okay, this expression needs to be less or equal to one. Why less or equal? Well, um, if it's equal, it means I have a, that employee has one shift on that day. If it's zero, right, that means that it has that employee has no shifts on that day, which is fine too, right? It simply cannot have two shifts on that day or three or four, right? So it needs to be less or equal to one. Now, in a modern constraint solver, it's going to be a far more SQL-like approach. What we're going to say is we're going to say, okay, we're going to just select the shift. We're going to join with another shift. So now we have a pair of shifts, right? We're going to check if these two shifts are assigned to the same employee. So this is the plan. This is the variable, right? The employee, right? So this is two shifts, same employee. And then we're going to check if they happen on the same shift date, right? Notice that um, what, what we can on the shift, we can just, uh, this is any code we can put in there. This is a, a lambda, right? So we can, uh, I'll show that in a minute, but um, we just fetch the date from that, that's on the shift object. That, this is again why actually having a shift object and an employee object is quite interesting because you can just pull properties directly from that object or model. And then uh, if that happens, if we have two shifts on the, of the same employee on the same date, okay, then we have more than one shift per day and we are actually break a hard constraint, right? So for every time that happened, we're going to lose some points. Now, um, I said on the left side, it's an equation. What you're really writing is a mathematical equation that says, for let's say we have three shifts on day one and two shifts on day two, right? Three shifts on Monday, two shifts on Tuesday. Well, you're going to check if shift one assignment and shift two assignment, shift three assignments, uh, which are all the combination with the, the same employee, let's say N, are less or equal to one as the Monday shifts. And then for the Tuesday shifts, we'll do the same. Uh, we'll do as four plus as five. So, uh, you know, zero ones plus each other needs to be less or equal than one. It's all mathematical equations, right? Uh, it's uh, all the way down, right? On the right side, however, on the modern approach, um, we, it's just a lambda, right? So, and, and, and I just want to point out that these are lambdas. So that means that you can put any code in there. You can, it's a predicate. I know it, it's not even a predicate. This is a, fetching a property. But for example, if you do want to do a filter in there, you say, okay, give me all the shifts, but I only want to have certain shifts that 
that follow a certain predicate, so that follow a certain condition, right? You can add something that returns a boolean. You can say, you can add a predicate, right? You can say uh, that shift, if the employee uh, works double shifts, then I don't want to uh, activate this constraint, right? So this will be, this, this, this extra predicate over here will basically make sure that it only counts for the employees who do not want to work double shifts, right? So, uh, so who do not uh, work double shifts, right? Um, and then, of course, if an employee doesn't work double shifts and he gets assigned to two shifts on the same day, then uh, we break a hard constraint. So um, I hope this 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 makes it a bit clear how it's a very very different world, and then uh, that's why they sometimes call me the maverick. And there's advantages to both sides, but um, uh, right? But I, I just like to point this out. Now, um, there's an interesting side effect to this. On the left side, when you have 20,000 employees in 20 days, a planning window of 20 days, that's 200,000 constraints, right? And, um, and, and, and you sometimes yield them, it's not per day, but even per shift instance or stuff like that. And so it's very easy to say, our solver runs billions of constraints. I see those kinds of claims all the time. We run billions of constraints. My solver doesn't, it, because this is just one constraint. Right, um, and only um, and only when this actually matches, um, uh, uh, then we actually create things in memory that say, okay, we have a particular, uh, you know, uh, shift with a combination with another shift that are on the same employee, same date, and then we break a hard constraint. But remember, the solver tries to minimize the number of hard constraints broken down to zero. So on, you know, a max, you might have like five of these broken at the same time in memory. Right. So the memory-wise, the, the the, the, the number of matches is not 200,000. It could be in theory, but in practice, it's going to be zero, one, three, or, or four, right? So, um, which makes a big difference again in memory consumption. So, um, I'd like to show a quick demo on, on, on these uh, constraint stuff. So, let me try to bring that on screen for you. So, what I've done here is this is an implementation um of uh of the constraints like uh this is for school time tabling and for now i've just disabled all of the constraints in, in the implementation and so let me show you what happens when we run this right so let me just see here we go uh, we need to assign a number of lessons to a number of rooms and time periods remember i've just disabled all of the constraints so the solver can do whatever it wants so when we solve this uh, what we have what happens is it assigns all of the uh, lessons to the same room and to the same uh, period. Obviously, this is a horrible school timetable because um, now, uh, you know, uh, Marie Curie has multiple lessons on the, at the same time. And of course, multiple students have multiple lessons at the same time and they're all in the same room. And so that's going to be a very chatty room. Right? Let's see if we can fix that. So what we can do is we can say, okay, let's en enable these constraints. So I'm just going to enable number of con uh, hard and soft constraints. So that's no two room. And so, Again, these are the constraints, right? Here we say, okay, select two different lessons. Uh, this is actually a convenience method to just immediately select two different lessons. And if they're in the same time slot in the same room, you know, then we have a room conflict and we have multiple lessons in the same room at the same time, right? And so uh, this is one of the constraints we enable. And if we now actually just refresh, right? Here we go. Um, and uh, we click solve. Uh, what you will see is that um, now we're actually assigning uh, uh, you have a you have a much much better schedule, right? Let's give it some time to find a better and better uh, solution. But what it it does here, let's stop it, and you can see that there is no geography and chemistry and there's uh, are at the same time, but they're in different rooms. That's not a problem. You can also see that they they have different uh, students and they have a different teacher, right? So none of those hard constraints are broken, and in fact, if you look at them per teacher. You can see there's even soft constraints happening here. In this case, there's a soft constraint that says, I want a compact schedule. So it wants to make sure that Marie Curie can only, only has to come to school one day and she all has her lessons back to back, right? So she doesn't lose too much time uh, waiting uh, between lessons or, um, you know, in the commute coming uh, back and forth, right? So, okay, let's continue. So, um, um, so, um, Numerical stability, these, these, uh, let me just switch through these, the numerical stability one. Uh, these were hidden, these slides. I, I'm happy to talk about it, but I have time limits too. Um, what I want to talk about is uh, fairness. 
um, fairness isn't uh, a linear fitness function. So one of the limitations that uh, traditional solvers typically have is that the, those equations that we build need to be uh, either linear or quadratic. And um, well, there's, there's some issues with that. The first thing I want to show you is that uh, fairness is not a linear uh, function. So what is fairness? Fairness is about when you start assigning shifts to employees. So here we have five employees, uh, V, W, X, Y, and Z. We have uh, 15 uh, shifts, A, B, C, D, and so forth. And you can see in this first case, we're assigning six, six shifts to employee V, five shifts to V, and so forth. You can see this isn't really a fair distribution because um, we have 15 shifts, five employees. They should all be getting three shifts ideally, right? Unfortunately, because of skill requirements and so forth, that might not be possible. But at, at the very least, we want to get as close to having a fair schedule for everybody. Now, what is fair? That, that's a good question. So here's another uh, potential solution, right? And, and we'll need to figure out how to implement a constraint that actually you know, favors fair schedules, right? So first we need to know what is fair. Right? And so you can see here, in this case, uh, this is a better schedule because we have five shifts uh, to, the, to the first employee, five to the second Well, In the first case, we still had six shifts to the first employee. So it's, it's closer to everybody giving everybody three shifts, right? Um, and so one way you could do this um, is the uh, deviation um, is basically sum up the deviation from the mean or the average. So we know that the average is three. So we can actually just sum up, okay, this is six, so that's three from the average. This is five, so that's two from the average. And we can sum that up and we get minus 10. So the bigger this number is, the worse uh, the solution is. And now when you do that, and this is a linear constraint for the record, um, you can figure it out and, and you can do that. And that would actually work. That would actually favor the second solution over the first, because it will say this is more optimal. However, let's take a look at this third solution. In this third solution, do you think this is a more fair solution than the second solution? It's an open question. Is this last solution more fair than this, the second solution? Well, it's, it's closer to the average most of the time, like the yellow one has three shifts, ideal. Blue has three shifts, ideal. Okay, green and, and brown are a bit away from it, and purple is pretty far away from it. She, she, that, that employee has three shifts too many. Is this better than the second schedule? And I would argue it's not. It's not fair. And in, in, in most, most definitions of, of fair, it's not. It might be fa fairer for more people, but fairness is actually that go, that applies on the group in, in entirely. And what would happen is this, this particular employee, uh, if this happens every week, for example, has a rare skill or something, or is just, just you know, for other reasons and more interesting to, to schedule this, um, that employee would quit right, that would employee would resign. And then of course, it's the yellow's uh, turn to, to get shifts, uh, every six, six shifts and, and get a, a much bigger workload, right? So um, fairness is about whoever is, is, wor is worst off, improving their situation first before improving the other's situation, right? Be before spreading fairness uh, across the others. Fairness is something that applies to the group, not to a subset of the group. So, um, and the problem is with this deviation from mean, you actually get a score that says, um, you know, minus six, which means this, this is a better solution than the second one, according to the, to the, to the, the deviation from mean approach, the linear constraint approach. And um, it's not, right? And so uh, to give you an idea on what the real fix is, it's not, <laughs> it's just a, a way towards the real fix is uh, you, you multiplied, you, you, you squared the uh, workloads. And, and this would be actually a quadratic constraint, right? So um, in, in this case, what you say, okay, we have six shifts assigned, that's, that's 36 points we lose, right? Six squared, right? Five shifts assigned, 25 points we lose, we lose, and so forth. And then you would still get uh, the same score, but at least it's not going to favor the worst, worst of the two. It's, it's going to favor uh, both of them equally, right? And, um, and there, there, this goes much, much further, especially when you want to mix in other constraints and so forth. I've had a whole elaborate proof of that, which will would take another session, which most of you, most of people will actually be bored when I, when I do that presentation. But I just want to point out, it's not really a quadratic function either. Um, uh, at least I believe so. Right. Uh, yes, Jacob. Uh, you're muted. You have only a few more minutes. Yeah, finish. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll uh, finish up. Um, score presentation between the two is, is also quite different. A modern traditional approaches only support two levels. You either had hard constraints or it's a soft constraint. 
while a modern approach, I would argue, would allow bringing in a third level, a medium level, right, or even N levels. And so we supported what we call bendable. Basically, um, you can say I have a hard, a medium, a soft, and a softer level. And, and we see this. For example, we see the hard level is universe constraints. The hard, the, the, the lesser hard level is constraint legal constraints. Then you have soft constraints like um, you know making as much money as possible, then you have a soft constraint, a lower level soft constraint as making the employees happy as possible, and maybe a third soft constraint uh, for other things and, and so forth and so forth. So sometimes they mix them, but sometimes actually separate them. And, and you need to you need, and you need to first focus on, you know, um, uh, on, on a higher level and, and you don't want to give up any points there for the lower level. Now you could argue, why don't you just multiply by big numbers to the, the, more, the higher level constraints? That actually doesn't work. Um, but I'll skip that to the interest of time. But that, that's called score folding. Uh, it's broken. I can explain it uh, in detail maybe on the chat. And the other thing you'll see in scoring is that um, in the scoring type, in the traditional things, um, you, your fitness function is a 64-bit floating point. Uh, while in a modern approach, um, you can choose it. You, do you want an int? Do you want a long? Do you want a, a big decimal? It, it's all possible, right? Uh, because um, you, it doesn't need to be a, a, a floating point because you know, there's no linear programming behind it, right? You can choose. You can plug that in with an interface. Even. Um, okay. So um, just to end this presentation, you're probably wondering, but is it fast? You know, it has more features. Can a modern solver actually be fast as it scale? So I ran some band. So well, actually, um, so somebody ran some bench first. But anyway, um, here's a benchmark, and this is the case where all of the people who, you know, I'm a maverick, and all of the people who, who, who say like, yeah. Traditional solver is better for this and this and this reasons. They say this use case, that's a that's definitely a case where they're better. It's the cloud balancing use case, assigning computers to processes, actually processes to computers. And what we notice is for small data sets, yeah, the traditional solvers are better. You can see uh, a better thing here. The green one is the traditional solver. The red one is opt is is optoplanner out of the box, and the blue one is optoplanner tweaked. And you can see that the green one is better for smaller use cases. But when you start scaling out, uh, you can see that OptoPlanner here, uh, you know, that the traditional solvers are much uh, worse. And you can see this, this is a very huge gap, right? And, it, and when you get a little bit bigger, bigger, you get out of memory exceptions on the traditional solvers, right? And this is the use case that they're good at. But let's like look at the use case they're not good at. Vehicle routing, one of the most interesting use cases in constraint solving, I would argue, one of the most uh, pro prevalent at least. And in this case, they're completely dominated. The, the traditional solver is uh, consistently inferior on every single, every one of the data sets. So uh, these are five data sets for, uh, to, you know, a vehicle routing problem with capacity, this, this is a simple kind of vehicle routing problems, and then five cases with timing, so which is a slightly more advanced uh, form of the vehicle routing problem. And in all of them, the, uh, the green is either uh, slower, uh, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, has worse results in slower, but had worse results in a five minute run on four threads, right? Um, and um, in uh, and when scaling out, they actually start crashing, right? So um, uh, that, that's my presentation. If there's any questions, I'll happily answer those. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, that uh, it, it was good being able to have some interactive stuff as well. Um, Jacob did put in a, another couple of questions on Slack. I think we have probably time for at least one of those. He just he wanted to know if OptiPlanner participated in the MiniZinc competition. Until now, it hasn't. And the big problem with that is, of course, that the MiniZinc format is um, you know is written specifically for uh, linear programming solvers, traditional solvers. I would argue, um, for example, all of the uh, all of the uh, Input files have uh, are using uh, you know booleans or or inputs or doubles and so forth. But uh, there's good news. Uh, we are actually we actually have um, and uh, we were experimenting with um, a, a, a translator that takes the MiniZinc format or at least the FlatSync format and translates it into OptiPlanner. Now we do believe it's not going to be as efficient as a, a, a immediately writing an object-oriented model. Um, so it's better. Than, it's going to be worse uh, than, than 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 doing. It. You know, something specifically in the OptoPlanner API with the OptoPlanner APIs, uh, but we are experimenting it because yeah, the mini competition is um, yeah would be really nice if if we can see what kind of results we have there to compare with the traditional solvers. 
Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, especially because you have some benchmarks already that where you're doing some comparisons that look very good yeah. compared to traditional solvers. So it'd be nice to do yeah. it in, in more of an open competition. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. And this this benchmark that I showed earlier, there it was implemented specifically for the uh, optical implementation, but also specifically for the traditional solver implementation. I can't name the name of the traditional solver, but um, it, it specifically uh, really tailored like uh, it, it needs to be uh, based on a, even uh, you know, every solver has a VRP implementation, right? So um, it, it's not like we need to invent it. So um, it, it is. Um, uh, an, an interesting, uh, yeah, the mini zinc will be an interesting comparison to uh, an interesting data point, definitely. And Jacob also invited you to look at uh, one of the DM community challenges from September of 2018, so yeah. you can have a chance to, to go back. Maybe I just, uh, unfortunately, I don't want to steal uh, <laughs> the show, uh, but uh, I need to just clarify a few things about uh, modern and uh, traditional solvers. Uh, all uh, uh, solvers, what you call traditional, uh, they have two types of uh, user interfaces. One of them uh, is uh, using basic uh, language like Java or C++, so programmers can easily do it without learning new concepts. And uh, for example, JSR331 is one an example, but uh, I'm uh, promo promoting or just I'm specification lead for JSR331. But majority of uh, solvers these days use their own domain-specific languages. And and MiniZint is a commonly used standard and you cannot ignore it. And uh, there is also, if you look on, uh, for example, uh, OPL or uh, any other modeling languages, they all very, very similar to what you call modern services. And they represent constraints exactly, just slightly different way, but as friendly as yours. And this is just, uh, so everything is hidden inside. If you better in your, in your implementation, you certain you cannot ignore this uh, official competition and to show this, to prove it not on slides, but to prove it in competition. And from this perspective, when I pointed you to this challenge, uh, in in this challenge, majority of solvers failed. And there is a big discussion over the, uh, not failed, they found solution, but it's a very interesting way how they found solution, including uh, Gurobi, including uh, ILOG, and there is a very serious discussions inside. This is my just point, don't stay away, don't be maverick. Uh, yeah, really. I, I, or if you want I, to be I, maverick, prove that you are really strong. Yeah. And uh, finally, tomorrow we will have another presentation closer to DMN and uh, people from KU Leuven trying to extend uh, DMN uh, in uh, constraint programming optimization area and do this in a user-friendly way. I did this uh, 10 years ago, similar uh, things and uh, probably just don't ignore this movement too because you are much closer to our community. So. Uh, be more <laughs> open to this. Yeah, but anyway, absolutely. thank you. It's quite interesting. I know that your practical results are really impressive. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, thank you. great. So we have about seven minutes before the next presentation if you want to take a, uh, a quick break. And um, I will get.